Okay, great. So welcome again, everybody, after a week break with the conference and everything. Uh, so today we have uh, Lev Widmar from uh, Jorge Stefan Institute in uh, Slovenia, and I guess partly affiliated with the University of Ljubljana, although I don't quite understand the relation. Uh, is it like a joint thing or? Uh... Yeah, it's a joint thing, yeah, but uh, uh, yeah. So the primary affiliation is the Jorge Stefan Institute, but uh, let's say I'm partially mm -hmm. also employed by the university. Okay, great. So. Yeah, as you know, he's worked on all kinds of non-equilibrium topics, entanglement and things like this. But uh, today, I guess he will tell us about some um, recent work on uh, MBL systems, I imagine, right? Yes. Disordered spin chains. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, uh, Zlatko and uh, Achileas and other organizers, organizers for, for inviting me to, this, to, to give this talk today. So... Um, I will talk about ergodicity breaking transition in finite disorder spin chains with the emphasis on this word uh, finite. Um, so um, this work has been done in collaboration with, with, with my colleagues from, uh, from Ljubljana. So Jan, Jan Schuntes is my, my PhD student and then Janes Boncha and Tomas Prosen are my colleagues here from Ljubljana. So, um, we are interested in, in principle, so, so one of the biggest open challenges in physics is, is, is the many body problem. So now to, to narrow it down a little bit, we, we are interested in non-equilibrium aspects of, of, of many body physics, uh, which is currently uh, uh, being widely explored in different uh, subfields of physics. So, so, so the typical buzzwords that we, that we hear in this context are for example, whether the system thermalizes after uh, time evolving for some time or whether it doesn't thermalize or in other class of, of problems, people ask what is, what is the type of transport, whether it's ballistic, so sub diffusive, sub diffusive, or there is no transport at all. Then in some other communities, you can hear questions like, you know, what happens with quantum information? Does it get scrambled in time and so on? So these are different questions that people ask, but there, there, there are some common, common uh, underlying mechanisms that are responsible for all these, uh, all these rich features. And one of the uh, important mechanisms that is kind of believed to be behind all, all these things is something that we now uh, uh, call quantum antibody chaos. So quantum antibody chaos is a phenomenon that is like, you know, at, at this point as of uh, 2021, uh, it's not really rigorously defined. We have several working definitions. And um, so, you know, to, 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 uh, uh, to better understand how to, uh, uh, what does it correspond to and how to define it, how to, uh, uh, what are the proper ways to, to, uh, um, 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 to characterize it is something that is now currently being uh, uh, widely explored and, and I'm not going to contribute to the to the broader uh, um, to the in, in a broader sense to the to the to the new definition of, of quantum chaos. I will mostly use techniques that have been or measures that have been already developed uh, developed in the past. So now, um, still, you know, I said quantum many body chaos. I have to be honest. I mean, there is something that nowadays we would call single particle quantum chaos. That is, I would say, a pretty established context. Uh, uh, context uh, which goes back to 1980s to the so-called uh, quantum chaos conjecture made by these three uh, gentlemen um, which basically said that if, if, if we have a classical system where, where chaos can be uh, rigorously defined and then if there is a quantum uh, classical uh, uh, correspondence so if there is a corresponding quantum system then we can study their spectral properties. And if they agree with, with the random, with predictions from random matrix theory, then we can say that, well, then this system is, is uh, uh, quantum chaotic. And this, this uh, 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 agreement with random matrix theory is something that I'm gonna, I'm gonna exploit throughout my work um, in, 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 in different subjects. Now, um, one of the main problems when we go to quantum many body chaos, in particular, when we study systems is in a lattice, right? And all the systems that I'm gonna study are gonna be systems, quantum many body systems in a lattice, is that basically we don't have, first of all, we don't have a well-known classical limit of, 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 of these systems. 
Um, so as a consequence of that, um, we explore quantum chaos and, and quantum ergodicity in the, in the many body framework, which can be maybe uh, 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 summarized by, by, by this sketch that, that has a, um, that shows three main cornerstones. One is the, uh, one represents the characterization of, of, of operators, of observables in, in quantum many body states. Another uh, cornerstone is the, is the structure of many body states as such. And then the third cornerstone are the are the many body eigen energies of the corresponding uh, of the corresponding Hamiltonian, and and to to do that so to to, to study that one one basically needs uh, uh, exact approaches and and the method that I'm going to use uh, throughout my work is simply a numerical exact diagonalization which gives us access to all the many body uh, uh, eigenstates and many body eigen energies um, and. Moreover, I, I also um, mentioned that I'm also not going to go into details what is now the difference, the difference between quantum chaos and quantum ergodicity. This is also something that is being widely debated so far. So basically, I'm going to use these two words interchangeably. So I'm, if I refer to ergodicity, I have in mind also quantum, uh, uh, quantum chaos. Now, on the other hand, um, there is also an, an increased interest in, 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 the, in the ergodicity breaking mechanisms. So pe what people ask uh, uh, typically in this context is uh, under which circumstances one can actually avoid quantum, quantum chaos and quantum ergodicity. And there are now many examples that, that, that have been, uh, that, have been uh, uh, that are currently studies. I will just mention two of them. So one well-known case is, is the case of so-called beta ansatz integrability, which is, which is the case uh, which emerges in, in clean translationally variant Heisenberg chains and gives rise to many interesting phenomena such as well non ergodic dynamics, ballistic transport, general Gibbs ensembles, and, and so on. But for those of you who are not familiar with, this, with these uh, subjects, you don't need to worry because I'm not going to talk at all about them. So today, the the focus of, of, of my work is going to be another question. And this is what happens with an un Anderson insulating state upon addition of interactions. And, and there is a, a conjecture now that there is that this gives rise to a new phase of matter, which can be then uh, in analogy called uh, many body localization, the so-called MBL. And now if, if we want to characterize main features of, 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 of MBL is that since this should correspond to a non-ergodic phase, then this means that there should be a, some kind of phase transition, which is now currently called either dynamical or eigenstate phase transition um, to, from, a non, from, a, from an ergodic to a non-ergodic phase. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that there is some kind of, in some sense, there is some analogy with, with standard beta ansatz integrability in the sense that there is some uh, uh, emergent inter integrability as well in, 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 uh, in the MBL phase, in the sense that there sh should exist some uh, uh, local or quasi-local integrals of motion. So this is going to be this is going to be the focus of of, uh, of my talk today. So the plan of my talk is the following. So I'm going to have like like three. I'm going to focus on three main uh, parts. Three main. I'm going to have three main messages of this talk. And th these messages all, all correspond to the main question, how to detect ergodicity breaking transition in a finite system. Right? In a finite system that you can access, let's say numerically via, via exact diagonalization. So the first, the first, the idea of the first part of my talk is that, uh, is, is to argue that, that if one studies the competition of two time scales that I'm gonna define in the, in the next slides, one is a so-called Tauless time, another one is a so-called Heisenberg time. Then by asking when do they become similar or when do they ratio become system size independent, then this is a, this is a, 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 a hallmark of the, of the ergodicity breaking transition. So that, that's gonna be the first, the first part. The second part actually is gonna be orthogonal to this one. And it's gonna ask the question, well, if we have a transition, eventually a phase transition, right? Then do we have, can we observe some scaling solutions of ergodicity indicators across this transition? 
And I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to use three different quantities. Again, uh, one is going to be the ratio of these two times. Another one is going to be the level space in creation. And then the third one is going to be the eigenstate entanglement entropy to argue that the, indeed these scaling solutions can be found. And they, the ones, the, the ones, at least the ones that I'm going to show you today, actually even quantitatively agree with predictions that you get by using these criteria. So that is going to be the second, the second message of, of my talk. The third message is going to be that I'm going to argue that actually uh, a large portion of the literature so far reported, in particular in the last five years on this subject, actually, I would argue pretty much agree with uh, what I would, uh, uh, with, uh, um, with what I would argue is the ergodicity breaking transition invoked by these two criteria. So that is going to be the third, the third part of my talk. And if, if you think that something is not uh, clear or well explained enough, just interrupt me at, at, at any point uh, during my talk. Okay. So the models that I'm going to consider are, I'm going to consider are very standard models like dis disordered spin chains. So uh, one-dimensional lattice systems with periodic boundaries. Um, I'm going to consider in principle Hamiltonian with nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor uh, um, interactions. So these are interacting spin one half spin chains. The disorder here is introduced to be uh, to, to the um, SZ term. It's going to be a box distribution of the of the uh, uh, identical and uh, independently distributed uh, random numbers. To be slightly more precise, actually, I'm going to study two models two models that come out of this Hamiltonian. The first model is simply the nearest neighbor uh, uh, interaction model only, uh, the isotropic one where delta is one. So this is like isotropic disordered Heisenberg chain. And this is what some people would call the standard model of MBL in the sense that it has been studied by, by Pal and Hughes in their pioneering work in 2010 and, and many others, many other people followed, that, followed the choice of this model. Now, the second model that I'm going to introduce is the anisotropic disordered J1, J2 chain. So the chain, the spin chain with that includes next nearest neighbor interactions. Um, I'm going to use that for several reasons. One reason is that um, it is slightly numerically, uh, uh, the, the finite size effects or the finite size scaling are, are slightly uh, uh, more convenient here. Another interesting aspect is that actually in the context of eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, so this is the so-called ETH. So that is the that is of course that case of course refers to the to the um, uh, to the model without disorder. This is actually the standard model that has been studied all the time. But in the end of the day, the main message or the main the main message that you should remember from this slide is simply that I consider two different models, but actually they are very similar. So all the results that I'm gonna that I'm gonna show you today actually do not depend on the choice of this model. Okay, so let me then let me begin and and let me uh, um, let me start with the, with the first main message of, of of this talk, and this is to argue that that one can detect the ergodicity breaking transition as a transition that occurs when these two time scales are become identical or more or not exactly identical but comparable. Okay, so here now the first thing is that let me clarify what, what, what are these two times actually. So this the first time that we refer to is the, called the Taules time. And this can be calculated from the, from the object that we call the spectrum form factor, which is uh, uh, just the Fourier transform of the, of the two point uh, correlation function of the spectral density defined in this way. So that is a spectral form factor, K okay, of tau. I'm not, a, I'm not gonna go too much into the details, but let me nevertheless comment on what, what is shown here. So here, this is the sum over all eigenstates or better to say all eigen energies. So D is the, the Hilbert space dimension, which is typically ex, exponentially large in the, in, the, in the number of lattice sites. These are the many body eigen energies. Here one should take unfolding first to, to get them. That's why I refer to them as epsilon alpha, right? Unfolding in the sense that you set the mean level spacing to one. And then also the time therefore is, is, is the, what we call the scale time. And there, there is additional filter that we need to do to cut the influence of the lattice edges of the, of the spectral edges. This is the average over disorder realizations. And this is, this is a typical figure how that, that is for the J1, J2 model. 
how, how this quantity looks like. So these are the lines, the, the red one, the green one, and the blue one, right? So here you see that for, for very short time, there is some you know, universal short time behavior, but then it enters some non-universal regime. And then later at very long times, it, it follows some prediction. And this prediction is, 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 is made by the uh, Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And what we call the Taules time, or I mean, that maybe it's better to call it ergodization time. It is a time that is, I would say, very likely, I would say the largest physically relevant relaxation time in the system, in the sense that, that after, for times larger than this Taules or ergodization time, the dynamics is, are universal and, and featureless. And so the way technically how, how we define it is that that is simply the, the minimal time at which the spectral form factor matches the GOE prediction. So this is something that we call a linear, in jargon, we also call it the linear ramp, okay. So when this, so these are these points. So this, these circles here correspond to the, to the numerically extracted uh, uh, Taoist times. Now, the reason uh, um, probably why, why this is called Taoist time come, comes back from the single particle problem. And actually that, that problem, I mean, these studies now are almost now 50 years old. Um, um, it was the paper by Edward Centaules who, 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 who wanted to understand the, actually the transition in the two dimensional Anderson model, um, the localization transition. And they introduced something that uh, uh, um, now, today we call sensitivity to boundary conditions. They were interested, actually, they wanted to, to study the, the diffusion time. Actually, to be honest, they were more interested into, in energies, which is then the inverse of this, of this time. But they simply ask what happens if you, if you change the boundary conditions at the edges, uh, whether, uh, what, what, what is the effect? So basically, they were interested in the diffusion time. But, but it, it turns out that actually this diffusion time, so the time of, for, of the, of the, of the uh, perturbation to propagate from one edge to other edge of the system actually is the, la is the longest relaxation time that, 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 that you can also detect by the spectral form factor. Um, so now in the many body problem, I will, I will uh, um, be interested in the, in the behavior of the Taoist time um, in, in similar spirit than this was suggested for the, for the, um, um, to be relevant for the single particle problem, for the problem of, of Anderson uh, uh, localization transition. Um, so I will study the ratio of the two times as an indicator of, of quantum chaos. So the other time that, that I call the Heisenberg time here is simply the inverse mean level spacing. So the mean level spacing is of course the many body mean level spacing, right? So this is something that is the exponentially small in the lattice size, in the number of lattice sites. So it's inverse, the Heisenberg time is exponentially large in the number of lattice sites, right? So, so the working definition that here we take is that if this ratio, so we define it that way, so TH, so the Heisenberg time divided by the Taoist time, if this goes to infinity, it means that Taoist time is much smaller than the Heisenberg time. And this is what we call that it indicates emergence of quantum chaos. While in the other limit, actually, it suggests the breakdown of quantum chaos. Now, the reason why I would argue that this is a convenient quantity to detect the ergodicity breaking transition is that there is a clear analog with single particle problems. So this here I, I, I show, uh, before I go to the next slide, here I show some raw data for the two models, J1, J2 model and the Heisenberg model of the ratio. Actually, it's, it's the logarithm of the ratio of these times. So this is shown for four different system sizes. I haven't, I haven't um, written that here. The red one is the larger systems, right? Is the larger system. Uh, 18 sites, the blue one is the smaller system, 12 sites. So basically what just what I want to, to say here, I'm gonna come back to this figure that is just for you to, to see how this quantity really looks like. So it's clear that if the disorder is small enough, right? It's clear that this goes up, right? When you increase the system size, this goes to eventually to infinity. So it's this case, right? So that is this regime where one expects quantum chaos if the, if the disorder is weak enough. Now the question, of course, is what happens here, right? You see here at this point, actually they become of the same, they become comparable, right? Their ratio become of the order one, right? So log one is then zero, right? And the main question is what happens here. Okay. So now, what I want to argue, I mean, basically that's the main point of this of this part of the talk, is that 
This is a convenient indicator of the ergodicity breaking transition just because it offers a clear and straightforward comparison with the Anderson transition. And so it's actually interesting that that has not been explained into numerically into details until recently. And here, actually, our colleagues from, from, from Krakow, Kuba and, and, and his collaborators, they made a pretty good job in this, in this context um, um, to study the ratio of these two times. I mean, they didn't really call it this ratio, but L to, the, L to cube in the L cube in the 3D model, it's like Heisenberg time. So that is basically the ratio of these two times in the 3D Anderson model, and they see this crossing, right? And this, this vertical line is not, uh, is a result from the literature, right? I mean, that is a well-known transition that occurs at around 16.54 or 55, whatever. I mean, that, that is a question of the second digits today discussed in the literature. But you see that actually to say that, you know, the point where this ratio, whatever it is, whether it's one or two or 10, whatever, but when this becomes a constant, so system size independent quantity, that is actually a precise measure of the transition in the 3D Anderson model, right? And now, How as is I said- the tau time calculated here? Uh, uh, in the same way, through the spectral form factor. Exactly the same way as, as I described before for the many body system. Yeah. Of course, here, the natural question is what happens now if we contrast this? with the disordered spin chains, with exactly using the same procedure, the same spectral form factor. They, I think they even use the same spectral filtering that we use exactly the same thing. And what we see is, is shown here. So, okay, here we, we take the log of, the, of these two guys and we see things that I, I, I think look pretty similar to this, to, uh, to this figure. So there is a point for, in both models, there is a point that uh, uh, be, is system size independent, right? Where on the left hand side, the, the results for larger system sizes go up for, for on the right hand side, for larger system sizes, results go down, right? So there is a clear analogy with these two plots. So the only thing is that here we rescale that uh, with L. Okay. So now the reason why we rescale that with L which will maybe become more obvious later, um, um, but, but here, so, so far, the, the only thing that I want to um, say is that that is, so by requiring that this ratio becomes a system size independent number, it's a good indicator of the ergodicity breaking transition. Question. Yeah. So this is averaged over disorder. Exactly, yeah. So are there large disorder, uh, sample to sample fluctuations? I guess these systems are very small, but. but... Yeah, no. Uh, of Okay, of course, this is a very good question, needless to say, but um, um, I mean, yeah, th these questions emerge frequently. Uh, um, and, and, and the thing is that, that uh, um, unfortunately, I, I cannot answer, uh, give an answer to that, just because the spectral form factor as defined above is not the self-averaging quantity. So okay. I can only get one tau less time, right? So I think the proper, the proper uh, way, so, the main message of my of other point of other sections of my talker is going to be that you know that there is a consistent picture coming out of different ergodicity indicators. So um, I think then to study fluctuations, it would be then better to take some other indicators right? that show the same quantitatively the same uh, transition. But I guess it's possible to calculate Thales times in different ways, right? You're um, right. You're I mean, right. even the Thales definition could just be straightforwardly applied to a many body system, no? Now that, uh, that is not, I mean, okay. Uh, 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 that could be, yeah, could be, yeah. So I, I agree with that. I mean, one, okay. Even within the spectral form factor in principle, one has other measures, right? Like one can do a measure uh, averaging in time, right? For a single sample. That one can do, one loses resolution, but yeah. Could be done. I mean, I that that I think it's it's an interesting open question. This, this. Okay. So let me now go to the to the main to, to the second uh, uh, message that I want to uh, uh, present here, and this the second message is actually you can cons consider it as as being um, um, orthogonal to the to the to the to the previous question, right? So that is the the question if there is some kind of phase transition or ergodicity breaking transition, can we see, can we observe then scaling solutions at or around the transition? And 
these questions are have been motivated by you know, you know decades ago already in the context of let's say Anderson localization transition and so on, and so so the main idea here is that if you consider an ergodicity breaking indicator or ergodicity indicator as such, I will call it here just lambda, right? It can be anything, which is the function of system size and the lattice size and the disorder W, then it is expected that at or close to the transition there, it follows some universal um, um, scaling property. So here I express it as a function of L over Xi, where Xi is some uh, uh, power law correlation length with, with some exponent, with some critical exponent new that can be very, you know, that can depend from on, on, on the on the particular model. And that is something, as I said, has been has been widely studied in the context of Anderson uh, transition. So this is the uh, probably one of the first examples for um, from the um, from studies of 3D Anderson localization transition from 1993. So this is here the quantity actually that they studied. I, I would call it that is an uh, archaic version of the level spacing ratio R that we now consider because that is a number. But I think if if I remember correctly, that comes out of the integration of the level spacing distribution from some uh, um, from some value to, to infinity it, it, it's not it's not important for this discussion the only thing that is important here is that that number is defined such that if it's close to zero then it means that the level spacing distribution is Wigner Dyson if it's one it means that it's Poisson okay so this is for the 3d model for system sizes that probably were large for that for for, for those times today we can do it better but this is still already good enough i would say to to you know to make a clear case that the scaling solution does exist in the case of 3d anderson localization transition and actually this particular paper provided pretty accurate uh, uh, estimates of the of the of the critical point now the question is in this in this in this in this context so what happens now with the uh, disordered interacting spin chains and indeed, I mean, this question has been addressed 30, 14 years after, after this uh, uh, work by, by Shklowski and, and collaborators. So this, this work has been performed by, by Vadim and David, and which is now considered one of the, of the pioneering work on, on, on MBL. And the main message of this work is that, is that uh, uh, they proposed that the ergodicity breaking transition occurs when the R, and R is the level spacing ratio, it's defined here. I'm, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this quantity. So basically the, the idea of this paper is that there, if there is a transition, I mean, to be honest, I mean, this paper was written in pretty, uh, uh, you know, they, they just made a proposal. They, they didn't, uh, um, they were very careful about the wording, but they said that if there is a transition, it could be here, right? So for the, where R is very close to the Poisson value. So the R, as I said, is the level spacing ratio, which is the average over, you know, it's a quantity defined for, for two or three consecutive uh, uh, eigen energies. Uh, is this ratio, which is convenient because you, you don't need spectral unfolding for that. That's why now uh, many people use this quantity. And then once you define it, you need to average it over eigenstates in the same sample and then over different disorder to get just one quantity that is a function of W. Now, to be honest, the model that they studied here is, is none of the one of, of the two that I study. Actually, I think this model had next nearest neighbor repulsion, but not next nearest neighbor hopping. So the quantitative values here are not important, but the main message that I want to hear, uh, that I want to make is that people argue that, you know, if there is a transition, it should be here. So now, um, yeah. So so that was that was a, a proposal in two thousand seven. But now you know, um, um, for fourteen years later, you know that 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 results can be. I mean, these numerical results can be can be further improved. And actually, many people then studied studied exactly the same quantity for almost the same models, right? So this is what what we calculated for our model. I think that is the J one J two chain. So that is uh, uh, this R as a function of, of disorder W for different system sizes that range from 12 to 20, right? And um, people realized actually uh, that, that um, one can get a scaling, a numerical scaling solution of this quantity, um, which, is, which is shown here for the J1, J2 model. So the main 
So what can one learn from these quantities? So this is this is the scaling solution as a function of L over xi naught, and xi naught is is some is a, is a power law correlation length. So the thing that one could learn from this is that this this scaling solution is pretty good, right? On the other hand, one should also admit that it's it's not terribly good, right? Um, so there are basically two two main concerns uh, about about such such scaling collapse. One thing is that it's very general, right? That applies to any scaling solution. So how do we know that that is the optimal scaling solution? And then the second concern is maybe more and more technical. And this is that these values that people get, uh, that people get out of this numerical scaling solution. So new close to one actually violate something uh, that, that is uh, usually called the, uh, the Harris bound, which predicts that in 1D, this new should be larger than two. Okay, so this 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 led to many uh, discussions and questions. So what I'm going to now show you in the in the in the next five minutes is that um, what we found is another solution that I I think already visually it's, it's much better, right? If you compare, so that is the, the scaling solution for the same results um, as a function of different correlation length, right? And I'm going to explain you, as I said, in the next five minutes how 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 did we obtain that, but the main message that I want to that I want to uh, uh, give here to you is that basically we, we we can do much better, but it's not only a technical thing that we can achieve a quantitatively better scaling solution. There is an important difference here, and this difference is that this solution I you know discussed by many authors before actually is consistent with the original proposal by 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 Oganesian and Hughes that the transition occurs when these are is close to the Poisson value. While our, in our solution, actually this transition occurs where R is actually close to the GOE value. And now I'm not, um, I'm gonna uh, make this point later, but what I would argue here is that the values of the transition, spo transition points here actually are pr pretty much in agreement with the criteria, with the first criterion that I invoked in the first part of my talk, which is that you get a, a good estimate of the transition if you require that the Taulis time versus Heisenberg time is system size independent. So that is the main that is the main message actually that I want to uh, 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 present to you. And this is that the ergodicity breaking transition that we detect is consistent with all these indicators that we studied, and it's actually it's located at different points than usually considered in the in the literature. So now you may ask, so what is this correlation length? So this is what, what you know, what you may call BKT or KT, however you prefer, Berezinski, Kosterlitz, Taules type of correlation length. We simply consider that because several recent papers, in particular the RG, the, the normalization group schemes now have, have proposed the, the, the BKT nature of the, of the transition. So our goal was to contrast these two correlation length to see which one is more favorable. Now here, there is no problem with the Harris bound because you can effectively consider that as new going to infinity. So it doesn't violate any, any of those bounds. Uh, okay, so let me now spend one slide just to, just to explain you how, how, how we got this, this uh, how we obtained this uh, numerical scaling solution. So we obtained it by something with using something that we, we could call uh, cost function minimization with the floating crossing point. So there are three three main aspects of of, 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 of of this approach. So the first thing is that you study your favorite ergodicity indicators, you get the results, say using, I don't know, exact generalization for different disorders for different system sizes. So what you want, you want to have a, a you want to you want to get the optimal data collapse as a function of L over Xi, where Xi is either this, so what we tried is this BKT or, or, the, or the standard power law correlation length. With this, I'm not saying that any, I exclude any other possibility of the correlation length, okay? It can be something else, but this, these are the two that we compared. Now, the second step, which is here, it turns out to be very important to get, actually maybe the crucial one to get uh, the good scaling solution is that the, transition point, or maybe it's better to call it a, simply a crossing point because it's a, we are dealing with finite systems. It's something that we don't necessarily fix required to be a constant that is system size independent. So we tried, of course, many different functional forms. So it turned out quantitatively that the best scaling solution is given by, if you just consider the simplest function is given by this 
a, a very simple linear function. Now, on the other hand, and that's going to be one of the points that I'm going to make in the next slide, is that one can do, one can uh, have a different approach and say that we don't pre-impose any functional form of this and just take the crossing point as a fitting parameter. So for different system size, it's a different fitting parameter. This is what I have in mind when I say this W star over L, right? It means that if I have five different system sizes, like L equal 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, I have simply five different fitting points, five different parameters that, that can be fitted. And then one can compare which of the functional forms is, is it turns out to be the best. Now, finally, the, 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 the final point is that, that, is that um, we invoke something that we call the cost function, which is simply uh, uh, a number, right, associated to the to the to the given uh, scaling collapse. So this cost function is designed in such a way that if you have an optimal scaling collapse, so if this differences of two closest points and the sum of absolute differences, then it's just the same as the maximum minus the the minimum, which means that this is for the optimal scaling collapse. This is one. 1 minus 1 is 0, right? Otherwise, any other scaling collapse, the worse you get, the larger the cost function is. And then you can optimize it using computers, how to get the, the, the cost function, which is as small as possible. We find this useful because this gives rise to a, a quantitative comparison of data collapses, right? Because now, to be, I mean, to be honest, we mostly uh, judge by I, right? But here we really wanted to ask which scaling collapses are quantitatively bad. Okay, so this is the now the result. I have shown you already the results for the level spacing ratio. Now this is the result for the bipartite entanglement entropy, where we uh, perform a bipartition in two halves, right? So this is like a, a chain of twenty sites, ten sites here, ten sites here. We calculate for each eigenstate. We calculate the entanglement entropy, which is then averaged over different eigenstates and different disorder realizations. So this in the insets, I, I show you the 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 raw results, so the results of S, of course, it's here normalized to go from zero to one. Um, entanglement entropy for different system sizes as a function of, as a function of disorder. Now, these uh, 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 curves in the, in the main panel, these are the scaling solutions that I think are, are, are pretty good. And they're obtained by, by, by using the for, the, for the crossing point, we use this, uh, we use this uh, uh, functional form. Now, as I said before, you may say, well, you know, how do you know? I mean, how do you know that this is the optimal um, functional form? Of course, we try different other functional forms that were all worse. Um, but I think the main, the main, uh, uh, the ultimate test for the for the for the convenience of some functional form is that we perform something that is uh, 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 the cost function minimization for. Uh, for the for the case where we don't pre-impose any function form, right? So we say that the for a given system size, the crossing point can be anywhere. Okay. So here we compare these two approaches for these two ergodicity indicators. So that is a level spacing, that is entanglement entropy for two different models. And so uh, what we see is that the lines are obtained by using this simple functional form for the crossing point. The points are results if we don't pre-impose any functional form. And so what we see here is that actually these two results match pretty, pretty well. In particular, the slope of these curves is, is, is uh, uh, very much uh, uh, very similar to each other. Now, the, there is another point that I also want to make just to, you know, just to be quantitative, because in particular for the case of the Heisenberg model that I think most of you who studied uh, in uh, who, who uh, studied these models are the most familiar with. Now here, as you have seen, the crossing points in the Heisenberg model or the, yeah, the cross the, 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 the crossing points in the sense of the ergodicity breaking transition points in finite systems are around two, right? And so if you invoke this other criterion for the transition so that the level spacing ratio becomes similar to the GOE, then the transition point would be around 3.7 or 4, somewhere here. Okay, so this is quantitatively different. Uh, 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 are, these values are quantitatively much uh, different. Now, 
here one can then go back to the, this ratio of the Heisenberg versus Tauless time and ask the same question, whether we can get the, the scaling collapse around, across the transition. And actually we can do that. We can get this, right? We can get again the, 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 the scaling solution and the transition point that we get out of that again is, is linear in L and actually this slope, this prefactor, this, the, the, the slope of this curve is very similar to the one that I reported in the first in the first part of my talk when when I uh, divided W over L and then I saw the transition at, at some fixed point. This is the slope of these curves. So the main message of all these two uh, 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 chapters that I presented you so far is that we use different ergodicity indicators. So we use so far three different ergodicity indicators and basically two different approaches. One is to require by hand that this ratio is system size independent and at the transition. And the other approach is to seek for the optimal scaling solution. And the crossing points for the ergodicity breaking transition in finite systems that we get quantitatively match extremely well. So that is, that is, that is the main result of, of, of our work. Now, in the last two or three minutes, let me also argue that um, what we see or, or the, the point where we argue that the ergodicity breaking transition takes place is actually pretty consistent with many other studies from the literature that also observe, I would say pretty interesting features occurring at this point, but were never really discussed. Right? So I, I, will, I will just give few examples because I, I think there are many more examples, but you know, just to be short, I, I, will, I will give a few examples. So regarding the properties of the wave functions, one nice example that they studied, uh, so in the group of Jens Bardason and, and Fabian, Heidrich, my, Fabian Heidrich Meister, is the, is the spectrum of, 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 so the one particle density matrix spectrum of eigenstates, right? So this is something that you see, if, if the disorder is small, this is just, you know, some, some line, right? And then when you increase the disorder, something happens. It's a, what happens is that the gap opens, right? And actually, I mean, this is the isotropic uh, Heisenberg chain disorder. And you see uh, actually that this gap, right? I mean, you know, in the, in the standard like metal insulator transition, there's a gap opening at when, the when the system becomes insulating. You see these gaps opens exactly around these values, or exactly at these values that, that, I, 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 that we detect. That is around two. It's not around four where the R becomes comparable to the, to the Poisson value, right? It's around two. And actually very similar results are reported in this paper when they study opening of the Schmidt gap, right? It's related quantity. Now you can also study what happens with the properties of matrix elements of observables. And this has been studied by many authors. One of the first were also uh, 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 um, uh, this group that includes our host. Uh, and what they observed, of course, they study different, different properties here that I'm not going to discuss. But an interesting thing that they observe is that the typical and average value of matrix elements of observable, they start, they split. They, they become different. And that exactly now, I think they consider the same model. And then exactly, again, occurs at this W around two that I have been discussed. And now, finally, I mean, there is this recent work by in the group of, of uh, Anatoly and Andres, uh, and, and also recently Marcus Rigol. Uh, they, they calculated fidelity susceptibility. They observed this clear peak, and actually, this peak, <laughs> this peak does occur again at the values that that I've been discussing here. Right? That is again the same model. So it's a disordered Heisenberg chain, roughly around two. It's not to run four again. Okay, so since I promised to be in time, now it's 45 minutes. So let me now conclude um, this talk by open questions, of course. I mean, as, as we know, I mean, this basically generates more open questions than, uh, than it, the questions that it closed, right? So the, there are two main open questions. One is the, is the big picture, right? The big picture is what is the fate of the, of this transition, right, from from ergodic to non-ergodic to to an MBL in the, in the thermodynamic uh, limit, that is that is the main question. But another one, which is more technical, but I would say maybe more important, or I, I mean maybe it's something that we can uh, 
more easily resolved in the, near, in, in the near future. And this is how to really, how, what, what are the tools to pinpoint the ergodicity breaking transition in finance systems. Now, in the context of this first, uh, um, of the first uh, um, uh, statement, well, as, as you know, right? I mean, so th th there have been some uh, controversy going on now in, in the interpretation of, of this result. So what is the, the fate of this finite size flow, which some people argue it's a, it's a finite size effect and, you know, it, it could be, right? I mean, we cannot disprove that it's not a finite size effect. Well, the only thing that I can say, I mean, if, if it's a finite size effect, it's, it's a pretty remarkable finite size effect because that is for the system sizes under investigation, there is no uh, uh, um, 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 it's, it's, it's hard to say that this is part of some other function that is gonna bend eventually at some point. But what, what I want to say is that I think for the more pragmatically, uh, I, I think this is currently even more important message of, of all this work. And this is to ask actually very simple question. And, and, and this is to ask given your finite system where you can study things, where is the ergodicity breaking transition where does it take place? And this is now just to be quantitative at the end, I, I come back to this example of disordered Heisenberg chain. So this is model one in my, in my uh, uh, labeling, uh, which is well known. And, and what, what is well known is that what many people considered in the literature is that when the level spacing ratio becomes close to the Poisson value, which is around 3.7 to four. Um, so, it is conjectured by many authors that this is the transition point. What I want to argue is that everything that I have shown you today in the context of this model for the system sizes under investigation, which are lattice sizes around 18 to 20 sites, the transition point is here. It's around, it's actually at way lower values of the, uh, uh, of the, of the, of the disorder. And all, all the quantities that we study consistently show that that is, uh, that that is something that you can characterize or pinpoint using different ergodicity breaking indicators. Okay, and with this, with this, I would like to thank for your attention. Great, thanks, thanks for the exciting talk. So I'm sure there will be some questions. Um, Shane, your hand is up. Please go ahead. Sorry, that was an applause hand rather than a question hand. Oh, okay. Um, no worries. Uh, any other questions then? Can I ask one? <clears throat> So, um, you know, I'm far from an expert on this, so probably I shouldn't be asking this while being recorded. But uh, I mean, this tallest time, you know, it can be calculated from from other. I, I think Lack asked this earlier. But if I were to calculate the tallest time differently, I don't know, calculating somehow the diffusion coefficient and obtaining it uh, from that, how well or not does it agree with, with the tallest time from the spectral form factor, for example, or in these particular systems near the transition. Look, I, I, I have a very simple question, uh, 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 answer to that. that. That's a very exciting question just, that should be just quantitatively addressed. So you see, it's, for me, it's an open question. Now, taking, to, to take it from the positive side, I think it's encouraging that at least what has been performed in last year is this comparison between non-interacting and interacting system using the same methodology. Now, probably the next step is to broaden this, this, this comparison using different methodologies and different models, different types of models. And in this way, we can get then more comprehensive picture about that. But I think you're, you're answering my question as if I'm criticizing words, but I, I really literally am just asking that for this check. Because I mean, I do know that people look, for example, the diffusion constant as you approach the, you know, it's a diffusion people and so on, as you approach the transition. So I mean, surely someone has inverted that and plotted it always, how well or not to the various 
You're getting you're getting different numbers quantitatively speaking. I mean, we we recently looked at this in a, like Floquet and BL model. I mean, the numbers are different, but you know, extracting Thales time, of course, is not the easiest thing in the world. So you know, there are some. Yeah. Um, so you know, it's they're consistent, but you know, they're still quite different depending on what what you decide to do. And I guess here you have an extra method because there's also like concert. Um, U1 symmetry, so you can really look at charge current, right? Uh, so you can really do also what Dallas was proposing to insert the flux and just, you know, um, compute the response, which is which you don't have in the Floquet case. Um, so yeah, this. So generally, on... generally, I I I don't I don't see the different approaches should different approaches should give the same answer up to the constant. And moreover, the way how you extract the tau less time from the spectroform factor is also not accurate. It's also inaccurate uh, up to a constant, right? This constant, it's, it's always, I mean, you, you have to define, you have to uh, see when does the spectroform factor reach the, the ramp, the GOE ramp, and that, you know, the way it never reaches, right, in finite systems, it's always some, it, it, it starts to fluctuate around some, there is some noise that emerges, right? So at some point you have to say that is that is the threshold, right? And of course that can be like factor of two or anything. I mean, that can, you, you easily, uh, you can miss that, right? But quantitatively, like, I mean, the, in the sense of scaling, right? I think they, sh they should give the same probably properties. Any other questions? Okay, another raised hand. I guess there's a question there. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering how strong is your case for the uh, EKT type of the transition? Because from my experience, I've seen that this type of scaling is quite amenable to collapsing and as, uh, also in your data you could see that pretty much all the critical data was just on top of each other so in the critical region so how strong is your case for the BKT transition there? Yeah so um, um, I um, especially I, if you have only few system sizes also. Yeah, so there, th th that's a good question. I mean, there, there, I, I, I think two orthogonal things in this, in this, in this, in this context. So, one thing is comparing two different correlation lengths, right? And another thing is what kind of crossing point you get out of that. So, uh, my main message here refers to the uh, quantitative values of the crossing points that you extracted from the from the from the uh, scaling solution. Now, as, as I said, as, an arg as I argued like uh, during my, 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 my seminar, um, we simply took these two correlation lengths because that is what have been, has been recently proposed, right? So I, I, I don't have any, any uh, 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 um, I, I, I would definitely not exclude other, scen other scenarios or other possibilities for the, for the, for the, for the correlation length. Right, which can be within the same framework, right? So that it's exponential, but with some other exponent or with some other functional form, which here for the BKT, it's like one over square root of the disorder, right? Or maybe even some other uh, functional form beyond exponential. So the convenient thing about this BKT is that, you know, it, it doesn't violate this, this uh, uh, hair, hair is bound. And in this way, it's, it's, it's more, uh, uh, just one more question. Yeah. So, have you yeah. also um, checked for an algebraic scaling and what exponent you would get? Yeah, we, we did. I mean, that is actually, I mean, all this for the algebraic scale is all these results were actually our results. But that has been reported by so many people before again. But what we get is very consistent with what all other people get. So, this with algebraic, with this power law correlation length, you typically get the exponent one. Uh, also, for the critical point, for the large R. Yeah, that, that, that is the case. Now, you know, to be, okay, here, yeah, that, that is a topic where I could spend, you know, another half an hour. So the thing is that it, depending on the type of the, on the type of the, of the, of the correlation length, uh, 
or, or the functional form of the crossing point, you can get better or worse uh, scaling solutions. So what I have shown you uh, in this talk are just the best cases. Now, if you just limit yourself, for example, if you, if you limit yourself to the, uh, to the fixed crossing point, right? So, so this first figure that I showed you about the scaling solution, which is more or less consistent with what, what other people have, have reported in the last 10 years, is that you put a fixed crossing point, which doesn't drift with the system size, then actually you realize that actually uh, BKT is worse. The, the scaling collapse is worse using BKT transition, right? So it's not, I mean, even, even the algebraic uh, uh, scaling solution in some sense can be better, can, be, can, can perform better scaling. Now, in a global picture, if you compare different functional forms and you ask, that's why we have this cost function approach where we can compare by numbers which scaling collapse is better, then the main message is that if you include this uh, floating crossing point, you get much, much better solution with essentially keeping the same number, the same amount of fitting parameters. Okay, thanks. I guess looking at this phase diagram that you have here, I mean, I guess most people who study the Heisenberg model would agree that there are some weird things that start to happen around double equal two. Um, but, you know, there's also this subdiffusive regime and that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. Zatko. That was kind of my main message, I would say. So it's, it's we, we fully, I mean, if we, if we take a look at all the literature in the last five or seven years, I mean, it's always there, but it's almost never discussed. That's, that's what I see, right? So, you know, so the, the main thing, the main message that I want to here convey to you is that if we can talk, I mean, of course, we're dealing with finite systems and so on, right? So it's question, it's, it's, it's questionable what, 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 what you, you can ask me, well, what do you mean with the transition in finite systems, right? But I would say, I mean, what I want to, to say is that if there is a transition that corresponds to some transition in the thermodynamic limit, it is here. It happens here. That's that's what. So, or you 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 can see it that way. The ad, ad, other way around. If you want to ask, what is the analog of the Anderson localization transition, which is well established, which is well known up to the second digits in the literature, in the context of 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 MBL or disordered spin chain, it's here. It's W two for the Heisenberg chain. That is the analog. That's what I want to say. And that, that's why I was so excited to see actually the literature that, you know, if I just look at the figures, they all agree. I mean, I, 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 there's no problem. I mean, the only problem is with in interpretation, but regarding the data, I mean, that is super consistent. Good, any other questions? Okay, well, perhaps not. So I think this is a good time to stop the recording in any case, and then we can just continue chatting for a while.